The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, why over 100 organizations have signed on to a Declaration for Democracy, plus a political historian on Donald Trump's chances in 2020, and why an impeachment investigation is still a good idea, and Bill Press with Brian Lamb on ranking the nation's chief executive. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Our nation's democracy is in crisis, and Lisa Gilbert says it's time for an arms race for reform to save it. That's why her organization and over 100 others have signed on to a declaration to restore democratic values to American politics and government. And we say hello to Lisa Gilbert, Public Citizen's Vice President of Legislative Affairs. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure to have you with us. Public Citizen is part of a coalition signed on to the Declaration for American Democracy. Lisa, tell us what that is. Yes. So the Declaration for American Democracy is a campaign to push for systematic reforms to our system of voting rights, our campaign finance system, and the system of ethics safeguards, which are no longer enough uh, to keep us safe from the abuses that we're seeing in this administration and across government. And we've been proudly a member and helping to lead this 130 organization coalition, uh, making this push a reality. Now, there is so much to be done to restore integrity to American democracy. What are your biggest priorities? Well, uh, you're completely right. Our democracy is under threat as never before, but we also think that there's more awareness of that than we've seen as well. Uh, And so we're hopefully in the middle of a a once-in-a-generation opportunity to fix what's broken. Um, So we prioritize our work into three clear buckets. Uh, You know, we think it's critical to fix our system of voting. Uh, Voting is a fundamental right. It's a civic responsibility. We want to make it as easy as possible. Uh, So that means policy changes like automatic voter registration, or fixing uh, and updating uh, the VRA. Uh, We think another key bucket is uh, the problem of money in politics. Uh, We want influence over government to be based on ideas, not the size of wallets, uh, which obviously corporations and millionaires and billionaires can use to outsized advantage. Um, So that means public financing and overturning Citizens United and many other reforms. Uh, And then our third bucket is on ethics. Uh, We want to make sure that uh, government serves the people rather than, uh, you know, private interests and corporate special interests. And uh, in order to do that, we need clarity around where there are conflicts of interest. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, money, uh, including revolving door reforms, um, come into place uh, so that we can fix these problems of ethics conflicts. I would imagine that ethics bucket is rather packed right now, given this administration. Um, the campaign includes over 100, advo- 100 advocacy groups, as you mentioned, How do you manage all the interests these groups represent? Yeah, I mean, I think the exciting part about this campaign is that, uh, you know, people are coming together not necessarily because democracy reform is even the first, second, or third founding priority of their organization, but because they recognize that uh, we have to win on this stuff in order to win on everything else. You can't, uh, as an environmental organization, win on all the things we need to around climate change. Uh, You can't, as an education organization, work towards uh, free and fair education. You know, all of the things that we want to achieve in other arenas are just no longer possible uh, in a big way because of these other uh, influence factors. And so, you know, managing the coalition has been pretty straightforward. People really get that this democracy stuff has to happen first or we're not going to be able to make change in all these other arenas. 
We're speaking with Lisa Gilbert, Public Citizens Vice President of Legislative Affairs here today on the America's Democrats podcast. Lisa, H.R. 1 is, of course, a very big focus of your work. What is essential about this bill and what does it mean if it fails to become law? So absolutely, we have engaged closely in the push for H.R. 1. We were thrilled to see it pass uh, with unanimous support from Democrats uh, and be introduced again with unanimous uh, co-sponsorship from the Democratic Caucus and the Senate. Um, You know, that's pretty unprecedented. It's worth saying that this has never before happened that we've seen unanimous caucus support for a reform bill of this scope. Um, So that in and of itself uh, is meaningful and a huge accomplishment and has been a central focus for the campaign. Um, But, of course, uh, we're in a moment where Mitch McConnell uh, holds the cards on the Senate side, and so we don't expect it, uh, although it's passed in the House, to also pass in the Senate. So now we're looking ahead to, you know, how do we, over the next 14, 15 months, build power and keep the pressure on and uh, make it a possibility uh, that we actually see passage of this reform uh, in the next Congress. Uh, And, of course, a piece of that as well is making sure that all of the different presidential candidates, of which there are many, many, uh, are also on board for these kinds of reforms. Well, and you mentioned uh, looking ahead. So let's look ahead to the 2020 elections. How will the campaign make an impact? And, and, and what exactly do, how do you I, I would imagine you just have to put unbelievable amounts of pressure on the Mitch McConnells of the world in order for them to budge. But what exactly would, would you do now to, so that we can see these reforms coming? Absolutely. I mean, we plan to continue to connect the dots between great state-level momentum on democracy reform and what we've seen happen at the federal level on H.R. 1 over the last several months, Um, you know, continuing to engage activists outside D.C. so they know this is a campaign that may take several years, but we're going to win it. Um, So that's a big piece of it, just uh, kind of creating connective tissue between federal and state work. Um, But then beyond that, we want to make this a central narrative the 2020 race. I think uh, we're in a good place because so many of those candidates have pledged to take no corporate PAC money or pledged to uh, take only small dollar donations. So there's already this feeling that it's essential in order to run um, that you have a position on this. Uh, And so our work is to make it kind of an arms race for reform. We want them all to be thinking about how to be bolder, um, not only how to support HR1, but how to uh, support HR1 plus. um, And so hopefully when we're in the next moment of opportunity, we'll have a a president who has already engaged in a huge way in these reforms and will be ready to sign a bill that has them in it. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, with such a retreat on democracy under President Trump, how do you convince citizens this is not a hopeless situation? Because there are going to be plenty of people out there that are just kind of, oh, I can't do this anymore. I can't take this anymore. Yeah, I think the reaction to that concern, which is, completely understandable in our current state of affairs, um, is to say that this is the only solution. You know, there are a million things that we all care about. We're thinking about the economy. We're thinking about our own paychecks. We're thinking about uh, health care. We're thinking about um, education and, and, and all of the other things that we want to achieve. And uh, without winning this foundational fight first, we have just a less clear-cut pathway to victory on any of those other topics. And so I think you know, convincing people that, that this is the fight to win, that it's foundational, it's needed, and we all need to be all in. What can anyone who's listening do to support the work? Absolutely. Well, uh, first, head to the Declaration for American Democracy Facebook page, like it, and then you'll get updates about the campaign. Um, Beyond that, uh, we're hoping to engage folks in states uh, in the next couple months. Um, So stay tuned for ways to support the federal level work and also connect it to all the great things that are happening outside D.C. And again, go to Declaration for American Democracy on Facebook. Uh, go and like it. It's, it's extremely important to get involved, folks. I and mean, you hear us talk about it all the time on the program. So uh, get out there and let's make this happen. And let's make 2020 a bit rosier than 2016. Uh, Lisa Gilbert, Public Citizens Vice President of Legislative Affairs. I want to thank you for your time today with us on the America's Democrats podcast and look forward to having you back again with us soon. Absolutely. Thanks. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. 
Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure, I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, a presidential historian says Democrats would be wise not to underestimate Donald Trump's chances in 2020. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Fats Domino sings, I found my thrill on Blueberry Hill. But America's richest corporate powers know precisely where to find their thrill. On Capitol Hill, they rushed there in 2017 with a passion hotter than high school love, spewing the pheromones of campaign cash into the Republican Congressional Caucus. Sure enough, the GOP Congress came through for the corporations, satisfying their lust to have their tax rate lowered from 35% to 21%, lower than a modest income working stiff pays. Actually, the corporate elites had not been paying anywhere near 35% since they used dozens of loopholes to cut their average rate to about 13%. Yet, Republican lawmakers coddled these privileged giants with a rate cut, plus they kept intact most of those gaping loopholes. Thus, many corporate behemoths paid zero in federal taxes this year. Or less! How is it possible to pay less than zero? by riddling the tax code with so many special deductions and gimmicks that the government owes you money. On tax day this year, a watchdog group called Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy issued a report documenting that 60 of America's biggest corporations used the GOP's tax cut and special breaks to avoid paying a dime in taxes on the $79 billion in profits they had hauled in. Indeed, they were given millions of dollars in rebates from our public treasury. For example, Amazon, which had $11 billion in profit last year, paid zero in federal income tax, instead plucking $126 million in rebates from us. This is Jim Hightower saying, This plutocratic ripoff is so shameful that a group of embarrassed rich people are calling for its repeal. For information, go to patrioticmillionaires.org. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Political historian Alan Lichtman's system has successfully predicted the outcome of every presidential election from 1984 to 2016. And while it's too early to predict 2020, he can say don't rule anyone out, including President Trump. And we say hello to Alan Lichtman, distinguished professor of history at American University and the author of nine books, including The Keys to the White House, The Case for Impeachment, and The Embattled Vote for America from the Founding to the Present. Alan Lichtman, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. My great pleasure. 
after you predicted the outcome of the 2016 election, and in your book, The Keys to the White House, you often point out that polls are a very bad way to predict an election. What are we missing by looking at polls? You know, polls, I hate to say this, are the lazy person's way of analyzing an election. If you're a journalist, you don't even have to get out of bed in the morning. Just read the polls and write a story about it. The problem with the polls is twofold. First of all, they are snapshots, not predictions. You take a poll, and who knows how the voters have changed, or the people you polled, not the voters, have changed their views a week or even days later. How do you decide that? There's no reality check. So you take another poll, and so on and so on, until you finally reach the election, and it doesn't matter. Second problem with polls is they don't necessarily poll actual voters. They poll likely voters, and they don't know who is going to vote and who isn't, and they have to do a lot of educated, but it's still guesswork about who the likely voters are. That's why my system ignores the polls, ignores the pundits, and looks at the fundamental factors that drive elections about which the polls are utterly silent. They tell you nothing about the real dynamic of elections. Mm -hmm. There were even stories of people that said, well, I couldn't admit in a poll that I was going to vote for him. Well, and that's they, exactly right. You know, I, yeah. I, you know, they say the error margin in the polls is plus and minus 3%, but that's statistical error. That's the error you would get, you know, if you were drawing red and green balls out of a jar. But there are so many other kinds of errors that creep into polls. As I mm -hmm. said, you've got to do a lot of guesswork about who's a likely voter. People might not tell you the truth. People might change their minds. You might have trouble with people not responding. None of that is taken into account in this plus and minus 3%. Looking ahead to 2020, a question on many people's minds is this. How possible is it that Donald Trump could win again? Yeah, I think, you know, the Democrats would be making a huge, perhaps fatal error if they think Donald Trump is an easy target in 2020. My system, 13 Keys to the White House, is based upon looking at the fundamental factors that drive elections, midterm contests, third parties, contests for the incumbent party holding the White House, long and short-term economy, foreign policy successes and failures, scandals, social unrest, the real things that drive elections that occur not just during the campaign, but during the term. And based on that, it is by no means clear that Donald Trump, or whoever is the Republican candidate in 2020, is a sure loser. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also a great deal of hope, of course, that the Mueller report could, in fact, lead to impeachment. In your mind, is that possibility still on the table? It absolutely should be. It is a huge mistake for Democrats to think, well, why should we bother impeaching Donald Trump when the Senate isn't going to convict him anyway? That's a dereliction of constitutional duty. The Constitution gives the U.S. House the sole authority to impeach. And the framers made clear this isn't some catastrophic episode, but rather impeachment was advisedly put into the Constitution as a peaceful orderly and legal means of dealing with a rogue ruler, which they expected, very different from the way rogue rulers were dealt with in their time by assassination or revolution. It is not the constitutional duty of the U.S. House to look into a crystal ball and try to figure out what the U.S. Senate might or might not do after a trial and a vote. That's a separate constitutional process. Uh, the Democrats have also fundamentally misread the impeachment of Bill Clinton, presuming that hurt the Republican Party because they overreached. Wrong. Yes, the Republicans lost a few House seats because of the impeachment, but they gained a vastly bigger prize, the presidency of the United States. Remember, George W. Bush won the presidency in 2000 by 537 votes in Florida at a time when the a cloud of scandal because of the impeachment was hanging over Democrats. And because of the impeachment, they put on the shelf their best campaigner, by far Bill Clinton. 
Can you imagine if Bill Clinton had campaigned in Florida? He could have turned a lot more than 537 votes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, short of impeachment, Alan, is it still possible that the Mueller investigation and its offshoot reports will build the case in voters' minds against a second Trump uh, presidency? I think that's possible. But what I'm advocating is not impeachment right away, but an impeachment inquiry. That's the proper steps. It was the impeachment inquiry, along with other investigations that established the basis for the House Judiciary Committee to vote the articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon. Impeachment is fundamentally different than all of these other threads. You had a lot of that in 2016. It didn't work. Why is impeachment different? First of all, it brings it all together in one place, rather than having it scattered in four or five different committees. You know, the voters just, you know, have become inured to that. Secondly, it gives a certain formality to the process that isn't present. You know, there have been very few presidents who haven't faced impeachment. Thirdly, it forces a trial in the Senate, and it gives uh, those who believe that President Trump committed high crimes and misdemeanors, an unparalleled forum. We're speaking with Alan Lickman, distinguished professor of history at American University, author of nine books, including The Keys to the White House, The Case for Impeachment, and The Embattled Vote for America, From the Founding to the Present. Alan, turning to Democrats in 2020, how do you see their challenge to win the White House differently than what it was in 2016? It's fundamentally different. According to my system, the keys to the White House. Elections for president are basically referenda, up or down on the performance of the party holding the White House. So really, unlike 2016, when Democrats were the incumbent party, they're now the challengers. And to a great extent, the election is not going to be determined by anything the Democrats do, but by the governance of Donald Trump and the Republicans. If the voters think that Donald Trump has governed badly, they're going to toss him out. If not, it's going to be very difficult for Democrats to win. The positive for Democrats is this huge contest that they're now having is just fine challenging parties. The out party can fight all they want, and historically that has no impact on election outcomes. Whereas last time when they were the party holding the White House, one of my keys to the White House is a big fight within the incumbent party that holds the White House, and the Sanders-Clinton fight hurt a lot. This time the fight among the 20 contenders doesn't matter. Hmm. Now, you've written about the tension for Democrats between choosing an establishment candidate versus a charisma candidate. Where do you fall on that choice? I squarely and clearly, and it's sustained by my historical research and my prediction system, the keys to the White House, fall on the charisma side. You know, many, many times the Democrats have said, we need an electable candidate. And in fact, if there's one word I'd eliminate from the political lexicon it is electable because you have no idea in advance who's electable. Many times the Democrats have said and followed up, we need an electable, experienced candidate who's been there before, who's knowledgeable. And they've done that. Walter Mondale in 1984, Mike Dukakis in 1988, Al Gore in 2000, John Kerry in 2004, and of course Hillary Clinton in 2016, maybe the most experienced and qualified and electable of any candidate. And what do those five candidates have in common? They all lost. Who are the Democrats who won? The -the off-the-wall, young, fresh, charismatic candidates. Jimmy Carter, let's not forget, that was 1976. You know, he was the outsider, the anti-Nixon. Of course, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Hmm. Now, of course, much will happen between now and November 2020, more than a year and a half away. What are the major trends, possible events that you'll be looking for that could swing this election? Yes, one of the advantages of the keys to the White House, the 13 keys, is they tell you exactly what's going to swing the election. Polls don't provide any information on that whatsoever. And some of the critical keys that still stand in abeyance abeyance are as follows. Will there be a contest for the Republican nomination? Will there be a major third-party candidacy? 
Will the economy sink into recession in the election year? Will uh, there be an impeachment which pins a scandal and turns the scandal key against the incumbent administration? Will there be a disaster in foreign policy? Will the Democrats be able to find a John Kennedy, a Bill Clinton, a Barack Obama, although they pick some boring candidate who won't turn the charisma key against the party holding the White House. So there's a lot that could happen. You know, there are at least half a dozen keys that are still undecided. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have to bring you back and talk to you more about this as we get closer. Alan Lichtman, Distinguished Professor of History at American University, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Alan, as always, we appreciate your time and do look forward to having you back again with us soon. Love to do it. Take care. Thank you, you as well. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press with C-SPAN's Brian Lamb on his newest book, The Presidents, Noted Historians Rank America's Best and Worst Chief Executives. You know, we have a lot of important guests in our studio, uh, but never more important than today, the founder of the great C-SPAN 40 years ago, Brian Lamb, legend in his own time indeed. Hello, Brian. It's good to see you. How are you? How, how do you feel about being older than the oldest person to ever <laughs> run for president? Who is uh, Bernie Sa Sanders? Bernie Sanders, and you're older than he is. Yeah, I, you know what? Just, wanna, just proves that he's not too old to be president it, of the United States. It doesn't. States. I wanted to wish yes. you a happy birthday. I know this is your birthday month. Uh, it is my birthday month. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's always also, I, it's also my wedding anniversary month. So I always look to your birthday to make sure that you're still about a year older than I am. <laughs> it makes you feel good. And, and as I was just pointing out before the break, the two oldest men who've ever run for president are leading in the polls among college students. Wisdom What does everywhere. that tell you? Huh? Yeah. It tells me that the people younger haven't gotten their act together. Okay. So I... <laughs> Um, I was on C-SPAN last night, thanks to you. I, unfortunately for me, I was watching. Uh, oh, my God. Okay. I usually am asleep by seven. <laughs> but with uh, Justice Stephen Breyer. I know. Um, I was surprised on, uh, on C-SPAN that Justice Breyer agreed that he thought that term limits for members of the Supreme Court are a pretty good idea. Well, after you've been there 25 years, you can yeah. say something like that. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. I was more interested in what you tried to drag out of him on television, although I've heard him well, say I all that. Well, I was going to ask you yeah. about that next, right, yeah. is I ask him uh, about cameras in the courtroom. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, and he gave, I thought, the standard answer that you heard 40 years ago about putting cameras in the house. This group uh, on the Supreme Court today will never get over it. I don't know what it is that happens once they get into that conference room, but they go in there having said on camera in front of the Congress when their nominations are being heard, television would be a good idea. It'd be a great opportunity to educate the public, and then they get around their colleagues, and it comes out a big zero. Yeah, because he said, I mean, among other arguments, right, the people then start to perform for the cameras, right? Isn't that what you heard Yes, what? and and there's no reason why they would have to. I mean, they're grown men and women, and they're smart as they can be, and just stop performing. Yeah. It's pretty simple. But And all those arguments against uh, cameras in the House and cameras in the Senate have just proven to be worthless, right? But even if, they, even if the arguments were accurate, uh, it's still the government that's paid for by the people, and they ought to be able to watch it. And if over time they can't, you know, rein it in, the, you know, grandstanding, then the Congress uh, will be thrown out by somebody. I mean, it's really the, the mentality is that w they blame us now for everything, as you know, everything that goes wrong. It's all television's fault. And I'm not talking about the court. I'm just talking about the public at large. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a shame that uh, it, 
this is an intelligent country that they can't go on television, deal with the issues without overusing it for their own purposes. So how many people watch C-SPAN? I have no idea. <laughs> I, have no idea. I knew that was going to be your answer, and I also don't believe you for a <laughs> I second. I have no idea. And, I, <laughs> you know, I've never had to care. That's the difference. You know, when it's all about the money. Our money comes to us from the private industry, and they have never asked us what kind of an audience we have, and they've always supported us for 40 years, and that's the good news. You must have some idea. No. Well, do you do the only, any polling at all about We don't do polling about – well, yes, we do polling. Every four years after the election, we try to find out if – you know, who can spell C-SPAN? Uh, and it's not S-E-A-P-A-N, uh, <clears throat> S-P-A-N, excuse me. But, uh, yeah, when we find out that, you know, it, the, the standard answer I give on it, it's about 10 percent of the society cares enough to watch on a regular basis. Uh, 30 percent more will watch it when it's something of real interest to them. And the 60 percent rarely ever get there. Hmm. Um, you have uh, had many honors in your life. Uh, it was about 10 years ago uh, that you actually were awarded the Medal of Freedom, correct? Correct. From the By President George W. Bush. It was a big moment in the history of uh, C-SPAN and for the American people. Do you remember this? Here you are. Here we go. C-SPAN is not what you call exciting TV. <laughs> Though some of the call-in shows do have their moments. <laughs> that was a big moment there, huh? Yeah. Most fun I had on that day was sitting next to Harper Lee. Really? Yes. She, she got the same medal at the same time. And, and no, it really was exciting. Uh, she was sitting right to my left, and she couldn't hear. She had bad hearing. She's a delightful person. And I leaned over to her when the president was making a presentation to her, and I said, He's talking about you. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then she was in a wheelchair and she was – it was difficult for her to walk. The military aide was supposed to lift her up and put her in front of the podium. And I had been a, a social military aide there years and years mm -hmm. ago with Lyndon Johnson and he didn't do it. So I oh. ended up – I had the <laughs> thrill of putting her up in front of the podium. So. Oh, my God. Yeah. That was the best part of the – and the be other best part of the day was inviting my wife to come up on the stage with me. That was a great moment. It was. Yeah, Congratulations was again. So uh, you, the, the president mentions there uh, that uh, the call-in parts of the show, which I always enjoy when I do with the, the, the morning show, um, Washington Journal, that, um, that they can get very interesting. And also, um, the comments that you get from listeners can be very interesting at times, and viewers can be very interesting at times. Uh, exam if, particularly, I remember when you um, didn't want Michael Savage on the air um, uh, anymore. You got in a little hot water uh, from some of your listeners. Remember this. But uh, I thought I'd just share with you as we go through this uh, half hour or so, some of the emails and what people that uh, listened to Michael Savage had to say to us. Eulario is what it says. Did you really turn off the free speech award when Dr. Michael Savage was to talk? How dare you? You are a Nazi and a Stalinist and are probably a homosexual, and I don't appreciate your agenda. <laughs> this is Stu Lewis, and he doesn't say where it's coming from. He says here, C-SPAN sucks, but not as much as you do. That's to me. Have a nice day, kid. I always thought you liars on C-SPAN were a bunch of bed-wedding commies, but well. now I'm convinced. <laughs> I will never watch the garbage. It reminds me of the mail that I get, Brian. I just wanted to share that with you. That was that was <laughs> such a, an extraordinary experience. Actually, the back story on that is that it wasn't that uh, Michael Savage couldn't come on C-SPAN. He had gotten a Freedom of Speech Award, Freedom oh. of Speech Award, uh, and oh. had, and was asked to go to Chicago to give a speech, and he refused and sent a DVD. And we said, well, if you, it's not important enough for you to go get the uh, award. It's not important enough for us to put it on. So we, that's why we didn't put it on. And then yeah. he came after us, as, as you can see. Well, I was proud of you because I think he's the most disgusting person on talk radio. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'll get those. Yeah. <laughs> you deserve them. All right. <laughs> so not only are you celebrating the 40th anniversary of uh, C-SPAN, how many channels do you spend now? Three. Three. And right. a radio station. And there you go, uh, the, the 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 empire of Brian Lay. Yeah, but you have huge. a a new a new book out about presidents of the United States. Uh, the this is available now, right? Today, 
Today. Yeah. All right. Pub day. You know what that feels like. I know. Yes. That's, that's You've correct. done that how many times? Uh, uh, ten. Yeah. I am honored that we see you on publication day. The president's noted historians rank America's best and worst chief, chief executive. You know what? Uh, the question everybody's got to be asking you, of course, is how the— We'll, we'll, we'll so save that to last about the current president. We don't. We who don't, are these? We don't rate him. You don't rate him. Who are the president? Who are the who are the historians you talk to? Who are the who do you think are the best presidential historians today? Well, I'd be very careful to say that's that. right. There's, okay, there are forty four presidential historians in this book because there are forty four chapters. Whoa, I and see. And they all come from interviews. Whoa, over the last thirty. So years. each one is a different. Each one is a different historian. And you know the, the, the fabulous regular names of the Robert Carrolls, the Richard Norton Smith, Doug Brinkley, uh, Edna Green Medford, who's at, right here at Howard, has been one of our uh, best guests over the years. She does a chapter in here on uh, Chester A. Arthur. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting because when you sit down and read about every single president over the last you know 200 and some years there begins to be a thread you know this more than anybody you know the thread that comes through the years and but it's never more clear when you're reading one chapter after another mm. from different historians about what the problems have been over the years and a lot of them are still with us is there a consensus that uh, among these historians that fdr or abraham lincoln the best president or this book is built around three surveys that we've done on presidents. And the presidents are listed, their chapters are listed according to where they were listed on the surveys. For instance, number one is Abraham Lincoln, number two is George Washington, number three is FDR, number hmm. four is Theodore Roosevelt, I can go down the list. Yeah. <clears throat> but that's all in there in the background material on how the survey was done is in there also. Is it based on their uh, accomplishments or how they... Or there their are, challenges or how they lifted up the American people? What is there are it? 10 categories. <clears throat> we ask 100 historians, hopefully from different sides of the political fence, uh, to judge them based on 10 categories. And uh, um, it works because over the years, no matter how many times you do these surveys, Abraham Lincoln or George Washington comes out number one. Hmm. With, no matter how many categories you have. Under, uh, and uh, we were – successful in getting some 60 or so historians to, to rate these um, presidents. And the survey, it's all online if you want to look it up. There's a fabulous thing on Wikipedia. You can look up every survey that's ever been done, and it's all done in a chart so you can see what's happened on the different surveys, not just ours, over the years. Uh, and if people go to cspan, c-span.org, they can find the, the, the listings for these two? Yes, for this book, I mean, yeah. yeah. And this book. Um, just fell out. Thank you. You're trying to steal my <laughs> No, I my just material. fell out. I didn't want yeah. to lose it. Uh, uh, <laughs> this book sort of is. This book is a $32 book. It can be had going to some of the online sites for 20 bucks, And, um, you know, it's 500 and some pages. Who, if, um, I will talk to you more about some of these ones at the top, but if Lincoln and Washington and... FDR and Teddy Roosevelt are at the top. Who are we talking about? Millard Fillmore and yes, Chester and, Arthur, and, and at the all the the ones we always talk about at the bottom. And and sometimes they're at the bottom only because they were there for a short time and they really never were intended to be presidents because you know we didn't treat vice presidents very well back in those early days. The bottom is James Buchanan. <clears throat> he always shows up on the bottom. I don't even know if it's fair. Uh, but it's happened for years and years, and it's primarily because he was the one that led us into the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And then Andrew Johnson doesn't do very well. He was impeached but not convicted, and he's the second from the bottom. And then you have, you know, Franklin Pierce gets a, a rap. He was only there for four years. Historians say that he was a drinker in the White House, but there are other historians that said he didn't take a drop of drink while he was in the White House, but he did have a problem. He did die of cirrhosis of the liver, and he, they, sadly, uh, he was not, it was not a good president. There are five members of Congress running for president today uh, on the Democratic side. Um, by my – I believe – I, I checked this not so long ago. Only one member of 
Congress has ever been elected from Congress to the White House. James Garfield. James Garfield. How'd that work out? Not sad. He, sad, right? He didn't last that long. He was a good from, person. and From Ohio. And was smart, but uh, was killed. Yeah. You know, assassinated. But like three months or so into his presence. I think. A little bit it, longer it, than that. Maybe, by, yeah. By Charles Guiteau. Charles Guiteau. His his he, assassin? His assassin. And Charles Guiteau wanted a job in his administration and kept hounding him, and he didn't get it. He wanted to actually be, I believe he was sent to Paris as you know, a foreign diplomat. And uh, there's one great story. Ken Ackerman tells this in his book, uh, who is a Washingtonian, a lawyer, and did a great book um, on uh, James Garfield, where Guiteau actually sat in Lafayette Park. And in those days— Across from the White House. In those days, Garfield, as president, didn't have any security. He was sitting there one day as he walked across Lafayette Park to go over and visit, I think it was James G. Blaine, uh, but he's sitting there watching him, you know, just hanging outside the White House. And then a few days later, shoots him at the railroad station down where the, the well, uh, he, uh, Gallery right. of Art is. You know? I was um, – the, the back story on that is uh, uh, that, that about a year ago, Congressman Tim Ryan, uh, who's been a frequent guest on the show, called me and wanted to uh, have dinner to chat about maybe running for president. And um, I w- wanted to make the case that you should run for governor of Ohio rather than run for president because nobody is ever going to make it from Congress to the White House. you got to have a step in between. So I did a little research, and then I found out, no, no, no. In fact, one member did make it from Congress <laughs> to the White House, and he happened to be from Ohio, like Tim Ryan. So it sort of undercut uh, – my, uh, Did he listen to you? No. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody but, ever? Do you but talk, I'll tell you. I just ahead. want to say, because you're so, you've always been so interested in, in presidential uh, candidates, do, do you ever talk on the air about your involvement in the early days of, of uh, Mr. Sanders? Uh, I have indeed, and yeah. I write about it in my Book? memoir called yeah. um, From the Left. Uh, and that doesn't mean I'm not supporting or yeah. Anybody. Y- but yes, was he, in was 2020. He, when you had your famous uh, dinner around your dinner table, was that the first time he actually had a meeting with anybody to talk seriously about running the, the last time around? Uh, no. I, maybe with some outsiders. That, that That's what I had suggested to him. But he certainly had talked to uh, Tad Devine, who had run yeah. his Senate campaigns, uh, because he had asked Tad to come to this dinner meeting at our house with a little outline of what he thought – could be done, whether it might be possible. So he talked, I know he'd at least talked to, I'd say, some of his political people. We would expect if he's elected for you to be the press secretary in the future, by the way. No, no, no. The oldest no. press secretary in history? No, I, <laughs> <coughs> I told him at that first dinner meeting what I wanted, <laughs> and which remains true to this day if he's reelected this time, not the last time. And? Ambassador to France. Why not? Right down there on the <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You, yeah, right. You can take care of the yellow jackets while you're over there because <laughs> they would look upon you favorably. There you go. So that's the only thing I want. Uh, I want to ask you about a president that I don't think gets enough credit. I just finished, and you've probably already beat me reading it, Robert Caro's book, Working. Mm-hmm. Tremendous book. Mm-hmm. And um, he is now on the is it fourth or fifth book on fifth. Lyndon Johnson. Fifth. Yeah. Um, I mean, Johnson was a giant in terms of what he got done. Why isn't he rated higher? He's rated is pretty it, high. Is it Vietnam? Yeah. Uh, All yeah, Vietnam. But, he's, but he's actually rated pretty high. If it hadn't have been for Vietnam, uh, I suspect he would be probably up there in the top five, possibly, you know, because of a, I mean, most people look favorably upon what he did for civil rights. Uh, not everybody, though. Mm-hmm. You know, we're still <laughs> – it's still an issue in this country after all these years. But the one thing that comes across, again, I've read the, all four volumes of, of Cairo and I'm reading Working, is that, I mean, Johnson loved power and amassed a great deal of power, but he used it to do a lot of good, great, and I'd say great things. I mean, just, just like where he started from in the hill country of Texas and the picture that Robert Cairo paints of how poor those people were, you know, and, and Johnson – Brought electricity to that whole area. Right? This is a, an odd an fact. Incredible story. An odd fact. You know, Catula, Texas was where he taught 
um, when he was um, a teacher down there, meaning Lyndon Johnson. Do you know who else is from Catula, Texas? All right. Sam Rayburn? Jeff Bezos. No kidding. <laughs> really? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Owner of the Washington Post and a thing called Amazon. And the wealthiest person on the planet, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. So and there ought to be two statues down there somewhere, don't you think? In absolutely. Yeah. And he came up last night in the CNN town hall. Bernie Sanders pointed out that Jeff Bezos is the worst, wealthiest man on the planet. Mm -hmm. Amazon paid zero in federal taxes last I year. I think the audience ought to know, though. I heard you talking about going back and watching the town halls on CNN. How late did you stay up? Uh, and, and what time did you get up this morning? Because they had to factor that in when they listened to you. <laughs> <laughs> I will say what some of the candidates should have said to some of the questions last night. None of your business. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite? I don't have one. Among the presidents. We don't have one. Uh, no, come on. I mean, not that. I the, don't have I don't one. Know, Republican no. or Democrat. No, it has but, nothing to do with that. I but, just don't have a favorite. I don't have a, you know, over the years, there's no such thing as a favorite interview, really. Uh, there are ones that are more fun than others, ones that are more serious than others, ones that are disasters, as you know. Uh, but I just always have I've never had a favorite. But some that you find particularly colorful? Well, I worked for two years as a Navy social aide. I don't want to give the impression it was a highfalutin naval aide around Lyndon Johnson and um, had not, this has nothing to do with his politics, but standing next to him uh, on three, probably three times a week over those two years was an extraordinary opportunity to watch probably one of the more vigorous presidents in history do his job. I, I, it turned out that I did a lot of the introductions. I would stand next to him and then oh, you as people say, came through the yeah, line, I yeah. would say Bill Press. Mm -hmm. So he would could say, oh, Bill, so good to see you again. But in, he did more work in a in – a, uh, receiving line than probably most presidents in history. And you'd just stand there and you could listen. I mean, you know, tell, I, I never will forget one night when he said, I want to go to Texas, get the plane. That was totally unplanned. And before you know, within an hour, the helicopter landed on the South Lawn and he was on his way to Texas, tra traveling down there on a little plane, a little jet plane that landed on his runway and his ranch at his ranch yeah. where he had it built for forever and ever so somebody could land he could land at his ranch anytime he wanted to you talk about the receiving line i remember caro talks about that johnson had a way that his father did too who was a state legislator in texas of reaching across putting his one arm on his shoulder on your shoulder and the other on your lapel did you see all that? the time? Yeah. The other thing he would do is get so close to you and your to your face that you would back. You can see pictures like this where whoever he was talking to would back way back and lean have to literally lean back because he's up here right on there <laughs> on his face, you know, punching his finger and you know, I want your vote. And it was fascinating to watch. Uh, did you see all the way with Brian Cranston? The portrayal of Linda Johnson. The I play. didn't, but I did see Brian Cranston in Network, which was all such a treat. It was. I yes, saw it too. Yeah. It was great. Right. Uh, how many presidents have you interviewed? I uh, six or seven. You know, some in depth interviews, some not so in depth. Uh, interviewing presidents sounds like great fun, but it's probably one of the more difficult things you'll ever do because they are interviewed so often, and if you try to do something new mm. and different. You find yourself searching for answers to questions that may not even be that relevant. Those have not been the, the most fun I've ever had over the years. Right. And I'm sure they're also skilled at avoiding your question if they don't want to answer it. I think most of the time they, they do that. They do you know, a pretty good job. I'd, <clears throat> I've never interviewed uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump, and uh, I, I suspect we won't. He, he picks everything fairly carefully. And uh, – he, you know, we, we do the long form interviews, and usually you don't get the the one hours that uh, we'd like to do. So where's uh, let's? Just, I know you haven't. Donald Trump's not included in here. I will uh, resist the temptation to ask you if he'd be the worst ever. Um, that's that would be my vote. Where's President Obama end up? He's twelve. He's twelve, and that was right after he left office, and so there was a lot of. Uh, you know, emotion about him at that point, and right. it'll be interesting to see in the next survey where he lands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, there's no way of knowing. Some of these presidents have moved 
rather far from where they start. Eisenhower is much higher now, up about, I think, number five. I right. And um, uh, Andrew Jackson is sinking uh, rather quickly. Uh, well, congratulations, Brian Lamb. 40 years of C-SPAN. Thank you uh, for all Americans for uh, what you have done for our country that brought us, bring us C-SPAN and uh, this easy access to our Congress and someday to the Supreme Court. Uh, and congratulations on the new book, The Presidents. Check it out at cspan.org. And thank you, Bill Press, for being what you are. That's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Lisa Gilbert, Alan Lichtman, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.